We're continuing our studies in Chapter 10 on signaling, and our subject for this lesson is the phospholipase C pathway. This is another type of second messenger system. So we still have a G protein coupled receptor. It's still going to interact and activate a G protein, except in this case, instead of the G protein interacting with adenylate cyclase to make it second messenger, it's going to interact and activate another enzyme, phospholipase C. Recall phospholipases are enzymes that digest phospholipids. In this case, it's phosphatidylinositol bisphosphate. The acronym for that is PIP2. So here we have our glycerol backbone and the two fatty acid chains in black and our phospho head group here in red and green. Phospholipase C is going to hydrolyze the bond connecting that phospho head group to the glycerol backbone. So it's going to cut the bond right here. And that clips this phospholipid into two molecules. On the top we have inositol trisphosphate. So there are three phosphate groups here in green. And on the bottom of our figure we have diisoglycerol. Now you'll notice that inositol trisphosphate, or IP3, has those three phosphate groups and so it's very polar, very hydrophilic, readily diffusible in the cytoplasm. And remember, that's the definition for a second messenger. It has to be able to diffuse in some environment and that's true for IP3. It diffuses in the cytoplasm and that's where it's going to exert its effect. Now let's look at diisoglycerol. So there's our glycerol backbone, our two fatty acid chains, very hydrophobic. The only polar part of this molecule is that OH and so that will associate with those lipid head groups in the membrane. And so you might think this couldn't be a second messenger but it actually is. It's diffusible in the membrane. So here we have a phospholipid already present in the membrane and all we have to do is clip one bond and now we have not just one but two second messengers. One we can send on a message inside the cell and the other we can send with the message in the membrane. Our inositol trisphosphate that's soluble in the cytoplasm is going to diffuse and open up a calcium channel. Note that this would make that channel a ligand gated channel. The, uh, uh, the influx of calcium will then initiate a kinase cascade and so we've accomplished one half of our mission by inositol trisphosphate. Diosylglycerol will remain in the membrane, it's going to diffuse and it's actually going to now bind a protein called protein kinase C. This docks this enzyme at the membrane and activates it. Recall a kinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphoryl group. And so now our protein kinase C is docked at the membrane and activated and it will phosphorylate different proteins and enzymes. This particular kinase works by adding a phosphoryl group to serine and threonine residues. Remember that those side chains have hydroxyl groups. And that's going to start a separate kinase cascade. So we've sent two messengers on separate missions and started separate kinase cascades. It's interesting to note that protein kinase C also requires calcium for its full activation. So they're kind of working as a team here. IP3 opening up those calcium channels to start one cascade and provide the calcium that protein kinase C needs. It's also interesting to note that phospholipase C can also be activated by other signaling systems. In other words, there might be other reasons to activate this enzyme and turn on those pathways. This is an example of what's referred to as crosstalk. That is interconnection between signaling pathways. We might need the same pathway to work under different circumstances or we might need two pathways to interact with one another under the same conditions. It's important to note that although calcium has influxed inside the cell and has an effect, it's not a direct effect. Instead, it binds to a protein called calmodulin, and that's pictured here in the ribbon diagram in the kind of a yellow-orange here. Here you can see the calcium ions in blue. It's going to bind to this protein. That will change its conformation and allow it to wrap around its uh, protein target and that protein target is pictured in the center here in blue. So calmodulin cannot perform its function 
to interact with these proteins in the absence of calcium. In our next video lesson, we want to consider the insulin receptor and see how it compares and contrasts with the G-protein coupled receptors we've looked at in previous lessons.